Time to take a look at Soviet infantry squad tactics of the Second World War. Now be warned, the source situation isn't the best. My main source is a translation of the combat instructions for the infantry of the Red Army Part 1 Soldier Squad, Platoon and Company from November 1942. Now the problem with army regulations is always that they were not necessarily followed. Also note that the squad generally don't act it alone, but as part of a platoon or a company. And speaking of army regulations, be sure to check out our crowdfunding campaign on the German Panzer Company manual from 1941. Also we added shipping for Europe. Now since we got those flanks covered, let's begin with the organization and basic armament of a Soviet squad. Now in June 1941, when the Wehrmacht attacked the Soviet Union, the Soviet rifle squad was quite different to the German one. It consisted of 12 men, namely one squad leader, assistant squad leader, light machine gunner, assistant machine gunner, grenadier, grenadier assistant, sniper and 5 riflemen. Whereas the German squad consisted of only 10 men in a far simpler organization. As you can see, no grenadier, no assistant, no sniper. But one more assistant to the machine gunner, the ammo carrier. Now this might not seem a big deal at first, but if you look, you can see that the Soviet squad had four different weapon systems. Sharp points out, the problem with this unit was that the lowest command in the Red Army, the junior sergeant squad leader, had to coordinate no less than four different weapon systems. Already in July 1941 the squad was reorganized and the grenadier was dropped and his assistant converted into a regular rifleman. As such the squad now had only 11 men. Now according to another author, the organization and equipment was quite different in 1941. By 1941 the basic infantry unit was an 11 man squad containing a squad leader, a 2 man light machine gun team, 2 submachine gunners and 6 riflemen. The issue is I'm certain that Sharp speaks Russian and he published quite a lot of in terms of Soviet tables of organization and equipment. As such I assume his information is correct. Yet it could be that Campbell is not wrong neither. Since official tables of organization and equipment could always differ from the reality on the battlefield. As always, take everything with a grain of salt. Finally, in late summer 1942, the squad was reduced to 9 men, reflecting the fact that firepower was becoming predominant over manpower at the front. The rifle regiment shut on 10th December 1942, which remained in effect for most of the war authorized two different types of rifle squad. The Type A, which was basically like the German squad without an ammo carrier. Whereas Squad B packed a bit more firepower by replacing two riflemen with a machine gunner and his assistant. Now in terms of weaponry, everyone except the machine gunner and his assistants were equipped with a rifle, usually the Mosin Nagat bolt action rifle. Alternatively, there were also the SVT-40 semi-automatic rifle. The machine gunner assistant was sometimes equipped with a carbon version of the Mosin, which could not fit a bayonet, had shorter range, but was also lighter. The machine gunner was equipped with a light machine gun, the DP-27, also often called the DP-28. It had a circle shaped 47 round magazine on top which earned it the nickname record player. Now let's look at some basic principles for the rifleman and squad. In general the duties of the soldier it is noted, every soldier must hate the enemy, maintain military secrecy, be vigilant, unmask spies and saboteurs and relentlessly act against traitors to the motherland. Nothing, including the threat of death, allows a soldier of the Red Army to surrender or in any way to give up a military secret. Now to put this in contrast, I could sadly not find a mention of surrender in the German army regulations so far, but the general tone is rather similar, although more refined. The German army regulation about the guiding principles for the education and training of the infantry from August 1935 demanded from the soldier unconditional commitment up to the sacrifice of one's own life. Now from the individual soldier let's move to the squad. The rifle squad is the smallest organization of the infantry. It fights with fire, with the bayonet, with hand grenades and fire bottles. The squad fights as part of the rifle platoon or alone. Furthermore, in every case the squad leader designates in his squad an observer of the enemy, a messenger and an ammunition carrier. Now some of you might notice that I previously mentioned that the German squad had an ammunition carrier and the Soviet did not. Well, there's a main difference. In the German squad, the ammunition carrier was a second assistant to the machine gunner, which was a permanent role. Whereas in the Soviet rifle squad, the leader could appoint any rifleman for the role. So let's look at the basic formations next. These are almost equal to the German ones, besides the obvious difference of being for just 9, not 10 men. 
The squad column looks as follows. The squad leader is at the front, followed by the machine gunner and his assistant, which is followed by the guide and four regular riflemen. The guide serves as orientation for changes in the formation. In contrast, in the German squad, the squad leader has no fixed position. This could also be the case within the Soviet squad, but it is neither explicitly mentioned, nor is this indicated by the illustrations in the Soviet manual, unlike in the German manual. Additionally, for the German squad, the man that everyone uses for orientation, so like a guide, was the Schütze 1, the machine gunner. He is also in the lead position. Now the deployment from squad column to center skirmish line is as follows. This is pretty much the same as with the German squad. Similarly, they are also deploying the skirmish line to the right and left, and if you want to know more about that, be sure to check out my video on German squad tactics. Let's move to the instructions for the rifle squad in the attack. Like in the German squad tactics, the squad advances along the principles of fire and movement. The light machine gun changes position at the direction of the squad leader. It moves first to the new position under the cover of the fire of the rest of the squad and neighboring units and covers by its fire the dash of the rifleman from the old position. The dashes forward are dependent on the cover provided by the terrain and the amount of enemy fire. The more open the terrain and the stronger the enemy's fire, the faster and shorter the dashes must be. Dashes should occur suddenly and exploit any reduction of enemy fire. At the end of his dash, the soldier falls to the ground like a stone, crawls unnoticed to the side and then takes up a firing position. Now in case the advance is suppressed by enemy fire, the squad should suppress the enemy. Where the machine gunner should engage at a maximum range of 800 meters, the most accurate rifleman at 600 meters and regular rifleman at 400 meters. Now the instructions on what to do under artillery fire is rather interesting. If the squad comes under enemy artillery or mortar fire, they infiltrate literally seep to the front of the bombardment without diverging from the designated direction of advance. This is in sharp contrast to the German instructions. The squad bypasses enemy artillery fire to the extent permitted by the order. If this is not possible, the squad rushes through the artillery fire during a pause. The squad goes to the ground itself if artillery projectiles strike nearby, or if the muscle flash, muscle blast or projectile noise indicate nearby impacts. Advancing shall continue as soon as the effect of the impacting projectiles is over. Back to the Sorbets, following the successful advance of the squad, the assault start position will be reached which should be as close as possible to the enemy. After arriving at the assault start position ordered by the platoon leader, the squad leader is responsible for all soldiers knowing the attack time and their fire missions and the terrain objective for the attack and the ammunition resupply available. The platoon leader orders the squad leader. He gives the command, prepare for assault. Thus soldiers load their weapons and prepare their hand grenades and once again the platoon leader will give the order, which will be followed by the squad leader's order, to the assault march. The squad moves forward quickly and without halting. They fire on the move and without bunching up and by firing suddenly at close range suffer no losses. Note, this is before the famous hurrah. At 40 to 50 meters distance from the enemy, the squad breaks into determined battle cry and storms the enemy position and destroys the enemy with hand grenades with fire from point blank range with bayonet and rifle butts. The light machine gun attacks together with the squad and fires on the move. Now this is followed by further instructions on exploiting weak enemy positions and breakthroughs. Additionally, there are notes on how to clear trenches and to be ready to defend against enemy counterattacks. Yet there is no word of caution like in the German manual. The moment of weakness after the penetration requires special caution and energy from the squad leader. The first thing to do is to assert what has been won. The squad that got mixed up during the penetration has to be immediately pulled apart and restructured by the squad leader. In contrast, the main paragraph about counterattacks in the Soviet manual is as follows. The squad repulses enemy counterattacks with fire and a determined bold attack in platoon strength. If the enemy counterattacks with tanks, the squad must fight the tanks with fire, hand grenades and fire bottles and the infantry following the tanks with rifle and machine gun fire. If the counterattack is against the neighboring unit, the squad leader is responsible to go to their aid with fire and a determined attack. Now let's look at the instructions for the rifle squad on the defense. 
On the defense, the rifle squad holds a defense position about 40 to 50 meter wide as part of the rifle platoon. The squad will be assigned direction reference points. Observation and combat sectors as well as additional boundaries for coordination with the neighboring units. The squad defends its position tenaciously. Once the squad leader has received his orders, he arranges for a proper defense by establishing liaison with neighboring units and the platoon leader, setting up observation points, scouting the terrain, explaining the order to his soldiers and making sure line of sight and fire are properly cleared. And of course that the unit is well dug in. As long as the squad is not firing, all the soldiers except the observer will remain undercover. At the order of the squad leader, all soldiers occupy positions from which, through the communication trench or covered routes hidden from the enemy observation, they can advance in column or simultaneously. Now similar to the attack instructions, the ranges are given at 800 meters for the machine gun to open fire, 600 meters for the good marksman and 400 for the regular infantryman. Yet Sharp added a note here. Here is one point upon which actual sword practice was distinctly different from that prescribed by the regulation. Far from opening fire at 400 to 800 meters, numerous German accounts relate that Soviet infantry would wait until the Germans got within 100 meters or even 50 meters or less, and then suddenly open fire from camouflage positions. Now I have found German directions from March 1942 for the infantry based on the experiences on the Eastern Front that confirms that the Soviets were masters in camouflage, yet there's no mention on the range usually would open fire. But let's move on to tanks. When tanks are detected, these have to be reported immediately to the platoon leader or any anti-tank units nearby. Furthermore, in an enemy attack with tanks, specific soldiers are responsible for fighting tanks. The rest of the soldiers conceal themselves in trenches and bring their infantry following or riding on the tanks under fire when the tanks approach the trenches. If the tanks go past, the squad must attack the following infantry and destroy them with all means. This is rather similar to tactics used in the Russian Civil War as noted in this video on my second channel. Now finally we also look at some instructions about the retreat. The squad retreats only on the order of the platoon leader going from cover to cover hidden from the enemy. They must break off contact suddenly during a reduction of the enemy fire or by exploiting our own artillery, mortar or machine gun fires, a friendly air attack or a smoke screen. Note that the withdrawal was very similar to the advance. The riflemen start a withdrawal under the cover of fire from the light machine gun and yield each piece of terrain individually or all together. The light machine gun withdraws at the last under the covering fire of the rifleman. The squad only withdraws simultaneously if they are covered by fire from another part of the position or by a smoke screen, fog or darkness. The squad leader moves together with the light machine gun as the last to withdraw. Now instead of a conclusion, I will make a final comparison of the German manual. In this case, we look at the structure of both manuals. In the Soviet manual, the part about the rifle squad consists of these points. Whereas the German manual, the part of the squad has the following structure. As you can see, both manuals are structured very differently. The Soviet manual focuses on specific tasks. Whereas the German one is focused more along a linear process. For instance, defense is not mentioned directly only as a part of holding a position that was already taken. Similarly, the march is rather early in the German manual, where it is only on the fifth position of seven points in the Soviet manual. Additionally, the part about the German squad has three levels of subdivision, whereas the Soviet has only one level. Gordon Rotman notes about the Soviet manual. Small unit movement and battle formations and the layout of defensive positions were simply described and kept to a minimum of variants that were relatively easy for inexperienced soldiers and commanders to visualize and comprehend. Now in case you like World War II manuals, Bismarck and I have translated the German army regulation about the medium tank company from May 1941, which builds upon the experience of the successful campaigns in Poland, the Low Countries and France. It encompasses topics like tank crew, training, formations, how to engage enemy positions and tanks. It is not a mere translation, it also comes with the German original text on one page and the English one on the other, 
Additionally, we added notes on terminology, translation decisions, a glossary and several other supplements as well. If you're interested, be sure to check out our Indiegogo campaign. Now thank you here to all my supporters, especially Andrew for checking the script and Peter from Tank Archives for helping out with some symbols. Note that any errors are still my own. If you like what I do, consider supporting me. Source are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.